The pad is, the yes. Surface the, the finished surface of the pad is, that's my pad level, yes. Mm -hmm. So that seems to be our convention that we're always sort of basically building below the level. Now for course one, okay, help me with this. Because oh, I haven't actually laid brick in a while. By the time I take in the brick and the mortar thickness to get the second course, like how high is it? Two and three there? quarters. Yep. Should be like two and three quarters. Two and three quarters? Is that what we want to use as a standard? It okay. depends if you use half or three eighths mortar. So everybody's going to be different. Okay. Go ahead and use whichever sort is going to make the most sense to you. Okay, but I'll use two and three quarter and we'll go with that. And what I'll do is over here for my course one, I'll put in here. And there's a lot of ways you can go ahead and type these dimensions. And I'm going to put 0, 2.75. Okay, 0 feet, 2 and 3 quarters. And you can go ahead and type that out as 3 quarters, but often it's sort of easier for me to do that. Now, let's go ahead, though, and kind of make a change here. Because what's happening is, in my elevation view, because I don't have a course that's only two and three quarters up, the scale is really like too, yeah, whatever, it's, we're too far out. We need to get in a lot closer because uh, the text is writing all over each other. So how about if we change that? I'm going to change it up to a sort of a really big scale, like one inch equals a foot or something like that. Okay, how about one inch equals three feet? Or three inches now, hang on, I go the other way. Uh, three inches equals a foot. Oh, that's pretty good. Okay, now I can sort of see things. We're way out here, but no worries. We'll go ahead and fix that in a second. But just set yourself up with some sort of scale that at least makes the drawing readable. I'm using three inches equals a foot, which is sort of really gross. Okay, so we got course one. Now before we go on too far with course one, let's stop and adjust it just a little bit. Because we have this issue of, really when we say course one, what do we want to see in that plan view? Well, here's the deal. Generally when you have a plan view, we say level one, but we cut four feet above level one. Because that's when we go through to a house or something like that. Pretty, typically a pretty good level. For this, I'm going to say, let's do something a little bit different. Because if I'm saying I want to show the plan of course one, I really don't want to see four feet above it. Really what I'd like to see is either right at it and just down below it a little bit. I don't really want to see it above. So although that's kind of different than our standard convention for these coursing diagrams, I think that makes more sense. So as opposed to being up here, let's cut right here and just look down the distance. But don't go down too far, because if I really just want to look at that one course, Okay. So let's show you where you adjust that, because it's really, let's get it for one, and then we can sort of, uh, you know, have it for all of them. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to course one over here. Okay, here's the floor plan. And where the issue of what the range is, what you're actually looking at is, it's over here in the properties. And you'll see it's, oh, down towards the bottom, there's something called view range. Now, actually, I'll comment on this. I always do this to my machine. It's a little bit confusing for people to have it set up the other way. By default, Revit opens up with the uh, little project brow or the properties over here. And if you want to, what I like to do is I just pull it over to the right side because I can see more at the same time that way. That's just strictly a matter of preference. So keep it whichever way makes the most sense to you. I'm on course one. Let's take a look at the view range. Here's the deal. It cut it at four feet above. The bottom is zero, and it looks down below. But it's not looking down very far. It's still looking down to zero. Let's think about this. What I would probably like to do is to actually cut at zero. Okay. I don't really want to see what's above my head very much in terms of these course diagrams. You can ask whether or not you want to see below. It might be helpful to see below. So what I could do is say, if the primary range is from zero even to minus two and three quarters or something like that, that way we sort of see the whole brick. And then I could actually go down even a little further if I want to, if you'd like to be able to see like a ghost of the brick that's below, kind of hanging out in the background a little bit. It'll show up with a slightly different line style. So you can try to distinguish what's in the primary range and it's a little bit further. Okay? So you certainly get a choice there. So what I'm thinking then is, let me switch back over to the elevation view just to kind of give you a sense of what I was, what I'm proposing. 
I'm saying, let's go ahead and cut right here. Anything from here to here is going to be in the primary range. And anything below that is going to be showing up grayed out or kind of ghosted out somehow that we can sort of just see it distantly. So to implement that kind of a strategy, I can go to course one. I'll say view range. And the cutting plane will be zero. The top will also be at zero relative to that level marker. Oh, the bottom, that'll be, I'm going to say minus 0 0.75. Okay, so I'm going to be able to see, consider the primary range be down to the bottom of the brick. And then for beyond that, let me go ahead and look a little further. Let me actually look at like five inches or something like that. So I can at least see the ghost of the brick that's underneath me. Okay, and it's below us. It's going to be considered a line type like below. Does that sort of make sense? Let's stop there for a second. That kind of, yeah, it's, it's weird, but all this kind of setting up infrastructure actually will help you a little bit later when you're actually producing your drawings. You're getting a view depth plane to set above the bottom. Let's take a look at how you're set up right now. Oh, it's that. Okay, stay close to that. So it's basically that zero, the, 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 the ultimate depth has to be below the bottom. So you have to make that in minus two and three order or even further. Okay, so here's the problem. Let's go show you what that is. Yes. And then, you know, in terms of getting going with this, you know, can you catch up in terms of the, the pad, or you have to draw a pad real quick? Sure. Let's get a picture going that way. It's just all the pad here, it's going to be a floor. <laughs> Yeah, I do I do so I do 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 Okay, so here's the issue in terms of the view depth. If anyone had it, the problem is your ultimate depth has to be lower than the bottom. So, for example, if you leave that to V0 and try to set it, it'll say that, hey, the view depth is set above the bottom of the clipping. And the view depth always has to be bigger there or deeper than the bottom of the clipping. And the difference between those things is what's considered below. We'll say OK to that. So now, theoretically, we have something that's only going to show that one in there. Let's go ahead and we're going to draw some more courses. So what I'll do is I'll go back over here to south or any of the elevations, I would actually like to go through and create a whole bunch of different courses that all have that same offset to them. So 
you can go through and draw them and kind of adjust all the dimensions to say two and three quarter, then five and whatever, the other that I'm doing now. So what I do is I tend to offset things. And to offset those things, what I would do is I'd go to the Home tab and go back to that Level tool. The Level tool, actually, we haven't been there yet. On the Home tab, there's a tool for creating new levels. And you can draw new levels, drawing just left to right to kind of create the levels. But what I'm going to do is actually do something called offsetting, which will then just sort of say, take the existing level and duplicate it a set distance away. So if you have a very regularly spaced building, that's actually a nice way to do it. I'll say level, and then what I'm going to do is, oh, i got to find, it's under the green tab for me now. I can modify or place the level. I can draw the level where I would actually just draw it out like this. But again, if I want to go through and, let me go back to level again. Instead, just do it with an offset. I'll choose the pick tool. The pick tool looks like a little green line with an arrow pointing at it. And if you choose that in the little uh, options bar, you can then type in an offset like 0, 0.2.75. And then what's going to happen is every time you click on a line and sort of stay near it, you'll see that it, as you hover over the existing level line, it sort of proposes where the new one's going to be. You can click there and you'll get course two. And you click on the next one, you'll get course three. <laughs> and slowly but surely you get them. And yep. what it's going to do is every time you click, it's going to create a new one. If there's a number or something like that that it recognizes as a pattern scheme, you'll go through and keep incrementing that number and let it do the math in terms of figuring out how high it is to get on up there. So go ahead and add as many levels as you need to. You probably need like a 10 or 20 levels. Yeah. Okay, the issue here is, since this goes to minus 2.9, let's shrink that. Oh, because it went to 2 and 3 quarters. So go ahead and we'll change it to 0, 2.75, and that'll be inches. Okay, and then since that's minus 5, we'll be the right order. Now you're going to do it. Now you're going to do it. Okay. Like, Great. So now we go back and let's see if we can create those different levels for you. How many levels is it going to take to do this? 22? 40. Uh, 40. 40. I'm at 27 right now. Yes. 40. 40. 40. 40. That's relative to the scale you're going. So go ahead and change the scale. Like the equals a full load or three inches or something like that. And then it'll be. Basically, the, yeah, the, the scales by scale. Oh, I'll say it. I'll say it. Just put that first one in there, like 2.75, and then just start, yeah, oh, you're looking good now. Just kind of keep on step by step. You're doing good. Okay, so let me kind of put some more in here. Again, I'm going to hover, and every time I click, I'm going to get another one, and it's slowly but surely going to build up this big stack. Well, that's scary. I may need... Uh, I'll stop at 14 or 15. Oops, I actually made a mistake there. I clicked on the wrong side. I can undo. Undo is like this little guy up here. It looks like an arrow that points backwards to the left. Eight and one and an eight. It's going to be too tall. It's that last course of mortar. You're going to have to leave that. <laughs> okay. So go ahead and create all those things. And as, as you're creating them, noticing that over, over here on the left hand side in the project browser, you're getting sort of a lower plan increase in those different courses. I don't say I did too many. Um, but you, you can just delete them. Yeah? yeah. Um, it will probably warn you. It'll say that, oh, yeah, I'm going to delete a floor plan. That's okay. No worries. Okay, so let everyone kind of catch up there. People are offsetting. Now, hopefully, as you go through and build your things, just depending on the complexity of your money, you may have 35 different floor plans. Oh, you're looking good. Oh, I know. Oops. Offsetting is sort of an incredibly useful tool. Yeah, it's a lot easier.
Yeah, but don't worry if you don't have all 35 for now. Because we can just go ahead and build the first few layers of your wall and kind of go up from there. Hopefully, you know, it depends on the complexity of your design. You may need all 35 unique floor plans. If you do, your masons are probably going to complain to you. <laughs> so, see, your, your, your design isn't that incredibly unique that you need everyone spelled out. Often in these walls, there's a little bit of repetitiveness. And, you know, that usually works to your advantage. Okay, so we got our basic framework set up now. And you keep on working on yours if you want to keep on filling it out. We got a pad, a place to put this thing. We have a framework of these things. Are there any limits in terms of like you know, how on the pad you're supposed to be working? Like, are you supposed to stay away from the edges? Just as long as we don't go past. Okay. So you, we can go right to the edge if we have like, okay. like a six by eight by eight. Okay, no worries. So I don't have to worry about any exterior boundaries that way. Okay, well, let's go ahead. We're going to start like getting ready to stack some block and work with patterns and groups and arrays to hopefully make that a little bit easier. Okay, what we need to start out with doing is just creating a block or creating a brick or whatever is the, the type of unit that you're going to work with. And I'll go first kind of a standard brick, but if you're using block or something with an unusual shape, we can start ad adapting and adjusting and changing its shape to do whatever you need. But you're going to find that by default, built right into Revit, there isn't like a great block unit for you to work with. Although if we went to Revit City, we'd probably find some. But we're going to go ahead and just create our own because it's actually a pretty easy thing to do. So you can then uh, just create your own as you need them. Okay. So often in Revit, when we're doing walls, we'll just sort of trace an entire wall and say it's four inches thick of brick, and somehow they figure it out in the field about how to lay all the individual bricks. For your project, we want the individual bricks. So here's what we do, and this is really what you do in Revit whenever you need something that just isn't built into the system. And there's a whole bunch of things that are that way. So you should know this is sort of a good general principle. What you do is under the file menu, or the application menu, I guess they call it now, the big R that's up in the corner, you pull down to new as a choice. And then as opposed to creating a project, Go on down to this thing that says family. We want to create a family. And family is how we create all sorts of objects. That's how we create furniture objects and cabinet objects and just anything that's sort of a non-standard piece. We can create families. The nice thing about families is we can create something that has some size and shape and dimensions to it. And then as a family, we can copy and use it and duplicate it between projects or all over this project. So families are really just little building blocks. So it's going to work well for this thing. So what you do is you say family. When you say that you want to create a new family, you get this choice, really what type of element is it? And the choices here are really, really primarily the issue of when we choose to hide or show different categories of objects, what category you want them to belong to. So things like doors and furniture and casework, they belong to a specific category. How that affects things in invisibility graphics, when you turn on off layers of objects, you turn them off based on their category. So we're going to choose a category. There's not a really great one hanging around here for us to use. I'm actually going to suggest, suggest generic model, but uh, you can sort of, I mean, we can really put it into anything. It's not really, it's going to be really more ineffective, like uh, how it controls the visibility. And within generic model, we have all these different choices. I'm just going to choose a plain one for now, plain old generic model. Let's tell you about some of the variations, though. This whole notion of is something wall-based, or roof-based, or floor-based, that's this notion of how it's hosted. Where generic models I can put anywhere in space, anywhere in XYZ space, it'll let me put it in there and move it to it. A wall-hosted thing, for example, like a lighting sconce or a window is a wall-hosted thing, it has to be put into a wall service. Okay. Floor-hosted things, you have to drop them on a floor. They won't catch put them through the space. Um, Plumbing fixtures, like uh, wall-mounted toilets or urinals are wall-based, whereas a, uh, a typical standard toilet isn't, is a freestanding thing, it could be anywhere. You don't even put it on the floor, the way it's the right now. Ceiling-based things are like hanging pendant lights or down lights. So if something's going to have a constraint where you always want it to be hosted in something, you choose one of those special categories, but for us, just generic models would be okay. Because we just want our blocks to be able to kind of move and do whatever we need to them. Okay, so I'm going to choose generic. Within generic, I'll say okay to that. You're going to get something that looks like this. And this is a little environment where we can go through and just create our little components that we're going to go dropping in there. What you're looking at there are really just we're in plan view, we're looking at two reference lines, kind of a center line front to back, a center line left to right. 
And really, that's the origin. When you go placing things, that'll be like where, when, you're, when you put the mouse down, that'll be like where the object is placed, right by the intersection. Now, for our object, I'm going to suggest, rather than having it centered, I think as I'm laying the block down, I may actually want that to be like the lower left-hand corner or just like one of the extreme corners of the block as opposed to the center. So even though they're called left and right center, I think I'm going to try and build my little block just right over here. And really, you sort of do it either way you want to. You're just really you know, determining the insertion point and how it's going to lay out relative to where you drop it. So if you think about a brick, you know, there's lots of different sort of types. You know, the heights and widths and all those sort of things. Most bricks, typical blocks, can typically be modeled as like extrusions. Okay, and we can think about whether there's holes to minimize the mass or whether it's a solid brick. Let's just do a solid one first, then we can add some holes to it. But what I'll do is I'll use the extrusion tool. So on the home tab, grab the extrusion tool. Something that actually looks like a block right there. We'll choose extrusion. We'll come on up and use one of the drawing tools. And I'm just going to draw from the origin some nice little rectangle out here. Okay, and now I'll change the boundary of this to actually match the size we want. And this will sort of depend on, you know, are you using Roman brick or common brick? There's all these things. And what's the actual size of a common brick? Because I know I sort of assume eight inches by the time I sort of put in the, the mortar. Seven and five eighths. About seven and five eighths? Okay. And again, this will sort of vary based on whatever type of unit you're using. You know, Roman brick or a concrete masonry unit or whatever it is that you're doing. And for the width, is that about three and five eighths on that side, or is that what's on that side? I think of it as being three and five eighths. Yeah. But Beautiful. Okay. The final thing is really what is the height of these things. And since we're modeling it as an extrusion, I'll even sort of rotate this over to 3D so you can see it. You know, we can sort of choose how high you want it to be. Typically, by default, it's just 0, 1, or 0 to 1. And is it, what is it? It's 2 and a half or 2 and 3 quarters? What is it? What's that? 2 and a quarter. 2 and a quarter? Yes. Okay. So let's put that in there. Beautiful. One final choice we may want to make here is this whole issue of the material. Let's think about that. Okay. The material is actually sort of, you know, how it's going to render itself, what it's going to look like when it's cut. You can assign a material to those blocks. So let's think about this. We could go ahead and put in here a material like just brick, okay, and leave it locked like that. If you would like to, however, go ahead and give people the option of changing the material. So they could swap in something else if they need to, like a, so you can have two colors of brick, a light color, and a darker color, or something to fix a more interesting pattern. We can actually set that up sort of for a parameter that the user will be able to change as you're actually building your walls. So let's show you both ways. Okay, if you want to go through and just put in there that your brick is always kind of a brick red, whatever, what you do is you choose material. And we can type in a name, but I always go to the little dialog and choose it that way. I will click on the little dot, dot, dot over here. I get to the little material dialog. There's nothing in here right now set up for bricks, so I'm going to add a new one. I'm going to call it, oh, I'll call it brick one, because I might have two different kinds of brick. I'm just giving it a name. Then I get to sort of choose the appearance for this thing. And you can go ahead and choose just a graphical appearance if you want. I'm going to go to the rendering appearances, not just graphics, but appearance, and actually choose oh, a rendered appearance for it. Under masonry, they have all sorts of different brick in there, red brick, white brick. Actually, for what you're doing, though, you don't really want a whole lot of pattern because we're actually going to be building your pattern. Maybe I will. Well, I don't know. I'm trying to think. <laughs> I'm thinking about if I really want to do this because I just really want kind of a deep red color more than anything. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just go back and kind of leave it at, well, now I take that back. See, my problem is if I use one of these textures, and then if the texture doesn't line up with where your blocks actually show up, that'll look a little bit funny. 
So what I'm going to do is actually sort of propose that we change that just a little bit where in terms of what's going on, I really, let me just go ahead. I'm just going to set a color for the thing as opposed to actually, uh, you know, assigning a real photographic image to it. So I'm going to choose a color. I'm going to edit the color. And I'm just going to find sort of what I think of as a bricky red. Can you use like a stack picture? What's that? The stack, yeah, picture. The stack. Well, the issue is, it's it's if your brick starts getting off of alignment from, since it's going to apply the material on a brick by brick basis, it's, it's whether your your image is going to get out of alignment with where your blocks are. So I'll play it safe for now, but we'll we'll keep playing. We'll see if we can figure out a better way to do that. So I'm using brick red, what I call brick red, and I'm going to say use the render appearance for shading. That way, if I have a shaded view, it'll show up in that kind of brick red color. Or you might go for a tan or a gold or something like that, whatever you have in mind. There's the issue of should this thing have a surface pattern? And if you want it to have a little stippling or something like that, you can have that. Probably more interesting, though, for you guys is putting a cut pattern on it because when you go through and cut a section, if you'd like to have uh, diagonal lines or something like that, this is where you can do it so that when you cut through them, they'll actually have that sort of diagonal appearance. So surface pattern, I'm just going to leave blank. But for a cut pattern, let me see if I can find something that looks good. I could say diagonal up or down. I'll just choose diagonal up. Actually, I should warn you about this in terms of doing this. Um, there, in terms for patterns, let's show you how you can sort of adjust that. Because I chose one of the existing ones, but let's even create one that fall by ourselves. Because when I was doing this, what I found was that the lines weren't close enough for uh, what I wanted to see. So I'm going to go ahead and actually create my own little pattern here. To do that, I'm going to click on the dot dot dot. Check that and as opposed to saying diagonal up, I'm going to say new, or I could edit it. That'll work too. But as opposed to having them be the line spacing of 15 128s, I'm just going to bring them closer, like six or something like that. I just want a fairly dense pattern. That's all I'm thinking about. Okay, and again, this is only going to affect it in this one piece. So I think we ought to be okay. Good day. Hi, Mario. Very good. We're building blocks. Excellent. So go ahead and say OK to that. We'll have a pattern that's, well, I thought we are going to have a pattern. Let me choose diagonal up, our new one. Say OK. There's the pattern. And uh, when we say OK, you now have a material that's going to apply to this block. So the final thing will be just to finish it. Go ahead and click on the check mark, and that will generate the block. Okay, now if we shade it, you should sort of see that it's like this deep red color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, we're looking pretty good. Okay, so we went ahead and created a single block with a single material. But let me go ahead and show you how you can change that. Because if in your patterns you want to have light and dark, you want to be able to control that on a block by block basis. Yes? Oh, that one. I was going to try to get it. I used to get shit from I used to get shit from the Okay, we're looking at good looking blocks all over the place. Okay, that's looking fine. Excellent. Okay. Let's go ahead and make our block just a little bit smarter. That's part of the idea here is that parametrically we can have blocks that uh, we can change the properties of. And okay. It'll give us the ability to kind of mess around with the pattern very easily just by changing without having to kind of replace the blocks. How that works is as follows. Go ahead and choose your block. That block that we just created, kind of make sure it's in blue on your screen. And where do you say it's brick one over here, material brick one. Right next to it on the right hand side, there's actually a little button there. And if you click there, it'll actually give you the option of assigning a parameter to that. So you can go through and change it. So what you do is, again, choose it, click on this little button, and we can add a parameter. So I'm going to say, let me go ahead and call this the brick material. 
There's a choice here of, now is this something you want to be able to change on an instance by instance basis or a type basis? Let's talk about that for a second. If you really need the control to be able for every individual block on that wall to change them to different colors independently, it would be an instance parameter. Because then you can change each and every one. Okay. If you need, oh, two or three different classes of bricks. So you can have red bricks versus light bricks, and clear bricks versus solid bricks, or something like that. Then it's probably more of a type. Okay. And the difference is, if it's an instance, if you want to go through and change it later, for example, your light bricks, you want to change the color of them. If they're instance, you'd have to go through and change them all independently. Whereas if it's the whole family, a bunch of their type, if you change it once and all the ones of that type will change. So that's kind of the issue there. I'm going to make my color issue more of a type issue because I'll probably have two or three different colors, but that's about it. I don't really need, you know, a hundred different ones. So I'll say type, say okay, say okay, and we've got a block that is now ready to use. Yes? That's actually a very good question. The question is, can we also make different sizes of bricks? And the answer is yes. In fact, that's really a smart thing to do. So if you want to see it, I'll do it. Okay, let's do it. Because then you can have your brick is actually an awful lot like a block. You know, so I can make it a Roman brick. I can do whatever I need to. So let's show you. Okay, we have one particular thing up here, which is the coloration. Okay, let's go ahead and also do something that will give you the ability to change size. Now, before we go much further, why don't you save this guy away? Just because every once in a while, you lose things. You can go ahead and do a save. It's going to ask you to put it somewhere. I'm going to put it in my documents folder. I'm going to say this is my NGIT. It's going to be my brick. And I'll say uh, color only. So it's ready to use, but we're going to go ahead and keep on going. In fact, it's kind of a good general principle. As I go through and build parts, I tend to sort of build parts very incrementally. I'll change one thing about them. I'll see how that works. I'll change another thing about them and see how that works. Yeah, don't go in kind of making the world's most complex part and test it right off. It's, it's kind of good to sort of do this very incrementally and just sort of see how things are going. For example, let's change the size. Oh, we'll make a super brick here. We'll do the one that changes size, and we'll also do one that maybe has some holes in it. Ooh. Then you have a little of everything. Ooh, that sounded good. So let's show you how to do that. Go to reference level. Go back to the floor plan level. And here's how it's going to work. You got this little extrusion, and the extrusion is doing pretty good, but we'd like the ability to stretch it and change its size, change its length, change its width, even change its height. That way we can have different types that have different you know, dimensions to them. So how you do that is we need to throw some dimensions on here, but I'm going to tell you how to do it in sort of a very specific way that will give you more success. And that is, as opposed to actually dimensioning that little block itself, <laughs> This is going to sound weird, but see these reference planes? Okay. Reference planes are really good for stretching geometry. And if we actually set up a plane and then attach things to the plane and move the planes, it actually gives you a more reliable kind of stretch if you go through and do it that way, as opposed to just dimensioning directly to the block. Sort of what happens in Ribbon is a lot of constraints that are pushing and pulling on this block in different ways, and planes get a higher order of preference than just going through and changing the actual surfaces of it. So it's better to go ahead and put the planes in and try flexing them and then attach your surfaces to the planes. That make sense? Yeah. Kind of weird modeling stuff, but it'll work. Say, because I'm going to put a plane in over here. Oh, so I'm back on the home tab. On the home tab, where did it go? I will. F oh, back to the home tab there. You'll find under the datum, there's reference lines and reference planes. I'll choose the reference planes. And I'll draw one out like this. Does it matter where? No, because we're going to put some dimensions on it and kind of uh, you know, put it kind of on the side where you might want to stretch it to. I'm going to draw one over here. Looking good. OK, then the way we actually make these things parametric so it can actually stretch things is go to the annotate tab. And here's the deal. You put dimensions on these things, and anything that you can add a dimension to can ultimately become a parameter. So I want to put a dimension from here to here. I'm going to put another dimension from here to here. 
and those dimensions will ultimately become parameters that drive that plane around. Okay, and then ultimately that plane will drive our geometry around. So I'll say aligned. I'll put a dimension from here to here. I'm going to do another dimension from this side to that side. And then finally what I do is if I choose those dimensions, just click right on the actual dimension line, what happens there, up in the options bar, you get this choice where it says label, where you can add a parameter. So right up in here, you can add a parameter, and if you choose that, you can then go through and kind of give it a name that you can then use to numerically drive this. So I'll say add a parameter. I'm going to call this, what is this? This is going to be my block uh, length. Okay. Again, you can decide whether you have families or whether you have individuals that change. I'm going to make it a type because I want a whole family that are going to work together. This other dimension over here, I'll call that like my, it could call it width or depth, whatever you want to think about it. I'll call it my width, my block width. I'll also make that a type parameter. Okay, so far so good? Beautiful. Okay, now before we go, we got a couple more parameters to add, that's fine. Again, we do that by putting in the dimensions. So go ahead and get the dimension, and let's go from here to here, or actually this one to that one. Right there you go. And this one's that one. Take three, take two parts of time. Sorry, get the, get the, the three one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
First thing, we're going to jump the lines, then we're going to like move the block too. Okay, if your lines are moving, you're ready for the next step, and that is to actually lock your block to the lines. Okay, versions. Good. Thank you. Okay, so here's what we got to do. We're going to go through, and this is going to be the use of the align tool. Because the align tool is all about making things line up with each other and hopefully locking them with each other. So here's what you got to do. The align tool, let me see if I can find it for you. It's under the modify tab. And if I go through and I choose the align tool, the shortcut for that is AL, if you like to type things instead. Here's what you got to do. You say align. And what you do is you basically choose the line, and then you choose the surface that you want to align to it. And when you do, a little lock will show up right there, and you can lock it right in place. Same thing over here. Let me do it again. On this side, I choose the line, then I choose the surface, and then I lock it into place. I'm actually going to lock these two in place too, just because I really don't want them to move either. So if you lock things into place, again, it's a little bit strange, but the way the align works is you choose the thing that you want to align to, then choose the thing that you want to pull to it and lock it in place. Okay, and with any luck now, if you've done a good job, if you go back to those family types and you start messing around with the types again, not only are the lines going to move, but the block's going to move with it. Okay, so let's see if you get your block to stretch with your lines. Okay, I actually locked all four sides. Go and just try it. Yeah. Yeah, because if you lock all four, then you're like, you're, you're definitely golden. Cool. There's no way it can go wrong. Let's see if you can go ahead and like uh, just change the dimensions and get that block to resize itself. Looking good? Before you lock it. Okay, if you're feeling really good about that, just as a preview for everyone who wants to work ahead, if you go to the elevation and you put another reference plane in there, we can put a dimension on it that'll control the height of this thing too. So if you want to go work ahead and try that, go to the elevation. And you stay flat. Sitting there and wondering what the next step is. Okay. Yeah, that's good enough. That's a what you do is you go over to any of the elevations. There's my block. It's only two and five eighths or two and a quarter inches tall. If I want to get myself the ability to make it taller or smaller, what I can do is put in there another reference plane. And then, we'll again, we'll annotate it. I'll just call that the height. Oops. And I can give that a name like block height. So go ahead and see if you can kind of get through that. That's just really the basic step of really going through and adding all these parameters. How do you do that? I'm sorry. What I'm just doing is just switching over to the elevation view and doing the same basic thing. And then what I'll do is using that same align tool, I'll lock the top, I'll lock the top of the block to that. If I'm really good, I can also lock the bottom, but it generally will stay in place. So if you're doing good about all those three, all those things, let's do this. Let's switch over. I'm going to move that over to the 3D view just so we can check this thing out. But with any luck now, you have something where you can go through and change the height, the width, the length, anything that you want to do in here. And as you go through changing these things, hopefully that little block's going to keep on resizing itself. This, if I try to, if I click uh, Bandit Types here, mm -hmm. it doesn't give me an option to change the height. Oh, no worries. What we have to do is still add a parameter to it. So what it is, is over in that elevation view, okay, the final step is go over in that elevation view and you want to add a dimension to the green line. So again, it, let me put it on here again. What I'll do is I'll say, take that out, and I got my green line. I'm going to annotate and put a dimension from the green line. There. Okay, and then I need to give it the name, block height, and then that'll show up inside the dialog for you. 
But also remember to lock. You always have to lock the surfaces to it. But let's see if we can everyone get to a point where you have some nice block that's going to kind of keep on sizing and reshaping itself. This will be good. Okay, so go to that family types. Is it all locked in there? Excellent. So come on over here. And let's just try some different uh, parameters. So we got the height or the width and the length. That's a good. You want to put one on the height now, or just just this? Way? We're adding the width and length. Is that? Oh, well, that's a whole nether issue. You know, you can go ahead and have mortars show up in there and decide whether or not to sort of turn that on or off because you'll need it on some and not others. I would say, how about we won't do it for what we're doing now, but that would be a really good way to extend it in terms of going one step further with all this is to really, yeah. Add some more things to it. In fact, well, I'm going to extend it one step further. We're going to put some holes in this brick. Okay. But, and you know, some bricks have notches on them. You know, a lot of stuff that goes on with people in bricks and how that all works. But let's just go ahead and get our basic brick going, and then we'll learn how to stack them. So, how are we doing in terms of feeling about our basic brick and our resizability? Resizability feel pretty good? Yeah. No worries. Don't worry if your brick's a little bit behind because I think we'll probably have sharing bricks. Stuff like that. So if you don't quite have the height working or something like that, yeah, it's okay. We'll go ahead and you know, you'll pick it up from someone else and you can sort of practice with that a little bit later. Okay, so here's the deal. I got my block, it's kind of hanging around, it's resizable, height, width, all that type of stuff. And we can start getting really smart about this. I'm gonna show you how to put some holes in the block. Yeah, we could also go and talk about how you uh, add mortar and have that as something that you can turn on and turn off. The smarter you can make these parts, the better. That's really kind of the gist of it. Let's think about how the holes would work. Okay, as I think about these brought blocks, when you put holes in them, they're always kind of, you know, it's kind of a funny issue about how they do it. Often they'll be like, oh, two well, sometimes just three little drill holes, then concrete block, it's like two different segments, whatever, there's a lot of ways to do this. So, First thing, yeah, what kind of block do you, you want to put like a, like a big hollowed out like concrete piece where you block holes and there's like three drill holes or drill holes? Drill holes? Drill holes. Yeah. Okay, let's do it that way. What we'll do is we're going to figure out you know, there's going to be some places for those different holes. Like a trick that I is we like those places to actually move as the block moves. Okay, there's some sort of a relationship in that. So let's think about this. If this is this end and this is that end, like the center is probably one, there's probably one here and probably one here. If I broke this up into like four pieces, four segments, that might be enough to kind of figure out where these could be. And you always try to figure out just, you know, there's some pattern to it. Okay, so let's show you how to do that. And again, you can follow along or just watch along, whatever you want to do. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and do this and yeah, I'll go, yeah, I'll I'll try to keep it reasonable, but I wanna move through this relatively quickly so that we have some time to do some stacking and do some interesting stuff. But let me show you how this works. I'm gonna put some more reference lines in. Planes or lines? Um planes, excuse me. I'm I'm very bad about that. I'll use those two words interchangeably and I shouldn't. And then I'll actually put one across here also. So all I've really done was I sort of subdivided this thing up into you know approximate locations of where those holes are going to go. So maybe three across this way, maybe four across that, or two across that. Exactly. And don't worry about getting them exact yet, because we're going to do we're going to make them exact in just a minute. But let Revit take the take care of the work of doing that. So maybe three intermediate lines, north south, and one intermediate line east west. If you got those, here's what we want to do. Those lines actually have, if you think about it, kind of a special place they want to be. In that, if I would like these to all be even increments, okay, that's something that's easy to do. I can make that even increments, so that's always in the middle there. That's well, one way. Sometimes it's not. You know, sometimes we space them in another way where we have to kind of use a more elaborate formula. Let's just space them out evenly, because that'll be kind of relatively easy for us to do. And here's how you do that. If you go to the annotate tab, you'll find that there's these different okay, dimensions again. If you run a dimension like this, if you say here to here, and I'm clicking on all the different lines as a single string that I might want to have involved, and drop that dimension, 
somewhere in there, it's a little hard to see, it's way up there for me, there's this issue of is it an equal dimension or not? And maybe it'll be easier, I have a funny scale. Let me see if I can sort of, uh, again, make the scale different. Okay, here we are. So I have a string of dimensions, they're a little bit uneven, but there's actually this equal thing where it's not equal right now, but if you say make them equal, okay. Now the sweet thing about that is, if you change the overall length, they'll still be equal. It'll always be reinforcing that. Okay, so I'll do it in the other direction so you can see. I'm going to say a line, and I'm just going to run a string of dimensions, and I place it. And then there's this little, little widget that shows up that says equal or not equal. And if you click on it and you take out the little uh, slash, it'll become equal. And again, the nice about that is if I resize, and you can try that on yours, you know, hopefully your lines will all, if you make it fatter or you make it longer, either way, it should all be okay. And for you, I'm going to choose that line and suck it out of here. Beautiful. Let's do the same thing. So that'll always be enforced. This is the hard thing. Why don't you shit? Okay, looking good? If you're looking good on that, let's go ahead and add some holes to this thing. We'll have a very smart block. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to put some holes in here, here, and here, and right at the intersection. Okay, that should work out pretty good. For these holes, we're going to make them by extruding them again. I think it's probably a pretty good way to do it, but as opposed to making them a solid, we'll make them a void. Okay, and that way it'll kind of cut out as opposed to uh, adding. So how I would do that is, oh, I'll go back to the home tab and I use my extrusion again. So home and then we'll extrude. And what I'm going to do is come on over here and make sure you do this. Make sure you're right on the intersection because if I wanted to stick to that intersection, I need to sort of make sure I'm drawing the origin at the intersection. Oh, I should grab the little uh, circle too. But I'll do right at the intersection, make sure both the little lines are showing and it shows intersection. Then I'll pull out and make a hole. I'll do the same thing next to it. I'll pull out and I'll make a hole. And I'll pull out and I'll make a hole. Okay, that's okay. I can make three holes this way. Uh, let me go through and say that it's going to be over here, whether it's a solid or void, I'm going to make it a void. Okay, that'll make it subtracted away. Okay, in terms of how tall to make that, or how short to make that, Let's see if this will actually work. It actually is in there. If I know that the extrusion end always wants to be a specific value to match one of the other parameters, I can click on this little guy and just say, let's go ahead and make it the same as the block height. That way, it'll, the extrusion, uh, the void height will always match the other height. I can always add it. That's the glory of this book. Okay, and if you finish that, let's see if I actually did okay. Why haven't I, where have you been on my lap? Program. It's pretty good to be modeling stuff. Okay. I'm so you have right on the computer. Yeah, don't worry if your holes are different dimensions right yet. We're going to go ahead and give you the ability to fix that in just a second. But you're looking good. Let's put them all three in there again. Don't worry if they're sort of not so good. And then we're going to make it a void, which is over here. Uh, and for the final thing, let's make the height always match the same as the other height. If I click as a score, right? John, you struggle? Right there, right there. I'm sure we have a little bit of a height here. Um, so no, I'm just messing with you. We're just going to complete it. Let's look at it in the elevation. Oh, go ahead and do the alignment so it goes here. Like, I want to do this. So choose the green line first. Yeah. 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 Y
And then go up the here we'll always sort of resize the types that are family types. Cool. Now I'll just click. Now if you want okay, you got a good looking block. You can try resizing that a little bit. So let's go ahead and think about those holes. One last thing to think about this hole in terms of really making this kind of a smart piece. And that is as follows. As you go through and resize that thing, you may want to hold it bigger or smaller. You may want to make sure that as you make the brick smaller, the hole doesn't get bigger than the brick. Yes. It's just, you know, it's just that we had drawn a sketch of the boy, but we hadn't actually uh, actually created it. So we had a green snot boy. Yes. Okay. Let's go ahead and for our final thing before we break. Let's go ahead and make those uh those those holes smarter about what they're doing. Are they supposed to move with the brick? If you resize the brick, yeah, they should all follow along. What happens if you change the size? Actually, don't change the size there. Go ahead and do it up in here. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Go ahead and say, say we move constraints. Let's see what breaks. It looks like it was okay, but let's see what else breaks. It looks like they're okay. Everyone's wrong, we put too many constraints. It's, it always, this sort of thing where we make a smart object sometimes takes some tweaking because all these different parameters and constraints, sometimes we get them out of order with each other. Okay, you're looking good. Oh, no, you're good. Ah, okay. So that's this whole thing about the quality not quite being right that way. I'm not sure why it's not doing that. Let's go ahead and go down. We can try to sort of set it up again. It looks like it's there. It looks like it's in. Is that in trouble with that constraint? Don't know right offhand. You know, it's sort of hard to guess, but I think what we'll probably recommend doing is let's see if I can get to work on mine even. Yeah, you know, it is possible to sort of make things that just are like almost yeah. See where it says mm -hmm. remove constraints, so it's not liking that. I just did it when I did that. Yeah. When I made it. Let me see if I can get it to work. If not, we could say that's just getting too complex. Sometimes I try to outsmart myself in terms of doing this. Let's see what happens. The issue we're seeing is that if on some people, when you do the block width, if that changes, they don't recenter. Let's see if they do that or not. Make sure. It's now, for me, they did. So it's, it, it all comes down to it's really it's something about very specifically the order of how it all got created. But not to worry, we'll go ahead and share these with you. It's sort of the general principle. Okay, the final thing, and then we'll go ahead and do a little break, is let's go ahead and take a look at those holes and think about how to control those. Because for those holes, we'd like to have a parameter that lets us kind of in turn set the size of those things too. So how would you do that? What you do is go ahead and open up that thing again. 
actually what I'm going to do is actually uh, go back and what I want to do is change the sketch of the holes. So choose those holes, there's a sketch of them, and say edit the extrusion there. Okay, see if we can get them back to the pink lines again. So what I did was I went to the floor plan and I chose the holes and then I went back to the pink line sketches. Okay, and say edit extrusion. Right up there. Reference point. Go to reference level. Yeah, it'll be easier to sort of hit in there. Okay. Once you're there, okay, remember anything that can be dimensioned can be like a become a, a a driver. It can become a parameter that drives things. So what I'll do is I'll say annotate and I'll use the radial dimension as opposed to the uh, length dimension. And I'll say I would like to put a dimension on the radius of this thing. And I'll put a dimension on the radius of that one. And I'll put dimensions on the radiuses of all three of those little holes. Okay, once you have dimensions, what do you do to go through and uh, change them in to parameters? We should be able to select them. That's interesting, it's fighting with me. What's that? Let me see if I can get those to a point where I can select them. I could take the green check and put it in. Oh, to finish it? Yeah, then I was able to put some. Oh, that's it. Okay, so we put them inside, but they're visible from the outside. Okay, thank you. So it looks like we actually have to finish the hole. And then you can go ahead and add a parameter. I'm going to call this just my hole radius. And I'll also let that be a type parameter. But I'll make them all whole radius. Just like them all at once, right? Actually, you could, and then just change them all at once. That would work too. So writing a parameter thing, Yeah, add a parameter to all three of those, and then you could try making it zero foot one or whatever it is. Oh, not zero. Actually, that's interesting. That's not going to. It's not letting me change them that way. So I'm trying to think if it'll let me go through and change them. I think I should be able to do that. Maybe not. Sometimes it takes me some work to go ahead and get these all to change nicely. Looks like it's not liking my whole radius. That's kind of sad. Is it working for any of you? What? In terms of being able to change the whole radius. It looks like it's sort of fighting me on that. Let me try one other thing. Just yeah. No worries. Was that? Um, no, actually, it's, it's when I tried to do it as a parameter, it wouldn't let me do it. Let me try taking those off and do it a slightly different way and see if it does any better. If not, I'm not going to worry about it because it's we're, this is kind of the extra for experts, and we can always get it to work with enough uh, kind of playing with it. But I have some other things I want to show you, so I don't want to get bogged down on just the whole radius. Streets are not satisfied. Exactly. Now, if it's telling you that, then it means that it's not going to move it, and I think it's the whole radius. Let me see if I can do that. Nope. Okay, I don't think I'm going to be able to generate that whole radius for you. Sorry. Again, I think with enough playing with it, we'd figure it out, but I don't want to bog us down with that right now, since we have to do some stepping to kind of make this all work. So let's go ahead and do this. Just since uh, we're kind of at a point where well, we can adjust those to be a little better, why don't you adjust yours to look pretty reasonable relative to the size you want? Go ahead and make a brick that looks about the size that you want to use for your design and adjust those holes so they look good. And then we'll go ahead and like uh, start working and stacking. That's it right there. Okay, but in terms of thinking about it, there's all sorts of stuff you can do. When you start making parametric stuff, as you're sort of getting a brick ready to start stacking, let me talk about some of the things you have to watch out for. When you're putting things like hole radius, and you, it does work for us in just one of these, you have to watch out for things like this. You never want the hole radius of one to start intersecting with the hole of another, okay? Because then that becomes an invalid object. It doesn't sure really move it. So you often have to kind of be a little bit clever mathematically in saying, okay, hole radius can be no greater than the length by four or the width by, yeah. You have to put a little bit of if condition in there to make sure that Although you're trying to resize it smartly, you bound what people can do with this. We definitely get to the point where they just can't create the object because it doesn't know how to do that geometry. Yeah, so watch out for that. But the whole principle, try to make your parts as smart as possible. Okay. Everyone's wrong, run into a limit like this, but let me advise you about this. Because, okay, 
So you write this decision point now. We could spend the next half hour getting this whole radius to work or we can start stacking. So but stacking. I know exactly. I know which way I'm going. But the nice thing about family parts is even if we go ahead and start stacking, if later on tonight we figure out how to make the whole radius work, we'll change it in the family, okay, and all the stack blocks will inherit that change. Okay, so yeah, that's the kind of cool thing about doing this thing. Build incrementally, try to make it as smart as you can. Don't get stuck on something that you couldn't make your part as smart as you want to. Use it, and then as you figure out how to make your part smarter, swap that part in for the old part, and the stack will still work. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so just a general piece of modeling you like that. Yes? What do 3D do? I just Oh, that's just because the dimensions are so big. Change the scale. And it'll be a little bit better that way. Yes? Yeah, the hues do what? As in, what happens when you try to do something like that? Like, you know, you're to like, I don't say bleed. So you're having trouble with one of these trees. So what was you having trouble with? Oh, it's wrong. Okay. So what is having trouble with here is like somehow the like, holes and how they were anchored would be outside the bounds of risk. So again, we need to fix that. But for now, I'm just going to make a watch that sort of doesn't have a hole. So we're going to, you know, we'll figure out how to add some things. No worries. Yeah, if you come up with a size that it just can't work with, it'll complain. No, that's what I did. So you have like more like a big, uh, big country block. Okay, you're looking good. Looking good. You're cutting through. That's why you got the nice. Uh, that's looking good. Fantastic. Okay, how about this? Oh, we're gonna go for about another. How about this? Why don't we stand and stretch? Yeah, uh, come on back in like yeah three or four minutes. Does it do that? Uh, grab some water, whatever you want. Come on back in five, and we will continue and finish this out with stacking these things up. So okay, let's get ourselves going again. We'll try to use our little super block to do something. Our almost super block. It's got some work. But hopefully this will be pretty good. Okay, so here's what we want to do. Okay, I've got my block. I'm going to save it away again. I always like to save it and give it a nice name. And what I'm going to do finally is load it into my project. So I can either do that if I saved it out in the library, I can go ahead and just say load family here and find it somewhere on the desktop or find it where I saved it in my uh, file system. If you say load in family though, if you only have one project open, it'll pop in to that one project they have open. And hopefully you can see it's kind of hanging around. And it's ready to work with. Now, let me go ahead and change the size of mine. Why don't you go ahead and load one in there and we'll put it in there and we'll start, we'll create a family that has the right size and type and then we'll like go from there. There it is, look at that. <laughs> It could be at what level are you on? That's interesting. So let's go ahead and take a look at the visibility study. So um, try like a more kind of break. Just gonna modify it because I like the name in there. Like people break. Oh yeah. And I suppose we are going down the road. We have three which we have a new size. All we do is have a look at the calendar. Look at this. You have a thousand person. Oh, Yeah, I think the boss is going to crash That's what Steph said when she's doing it. It crashed her like, we should try doing this before. It's like a thousand bricks. Let's go to the lower. You might want to have bricks. You've only got like a couple of bricks. We were talking about it. So, since the pattern was actually one of the most popular, I was just wondering. No worries. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring a block in. Again, all I did was, I'll take it back out of here. What I'm going to do is just go back over to that family, that family, that brick that you created. Okay, and I'm going to say load it into the project. And when you load it into the project, it should hopefully start to show up over there. 
We can decide what level we're going to go ahead and put it at. The level we're going to put it at is going to be based on the lower left-hand corner. So it's like uh, if you want to put it on top of the pad, put it at pad level. Hopefully that'll drop in there. Now, since I created this nice parametric brick and I didn't do a very good job of resizing mine, let me choose that. I'm going to make a family that has the right size. So I'm going to say edit the type. I'm going to choose that thing and I'll actually change it so that it's going to be, oh, what was it? To be a standard brick, it is like seven and five eighths, something like that. Yeah. And then to be, oh, that's the width is only three and five eighths. Yeah, two and four eighths. Okay, and zero, seven and five eighths and two and a quarter. Okay, just be a little more standard. Hopefully it's in there. Now you can sort of move it around, use the move tool, get it to wherever you want it. Let's see how it's looking. Is there a way to change your aliases in um, sorry, shortcuts? Um, not, not really. It's kind of, you mean in terms of you, what? So you instead, of hitting you're M, looking? instead of hitting MV, you oh. hit M. Yes. Now, because there is keyboard shortcuts, and there's an editor for that. If you go to the options, so under here, there's a text file that has a bunch of those, and go to the options. And then somewhere in here, say user interface, it'll point to there's a file you can customize. Cool. So, where is it? Okay, if you, yeah, if you want it. It's under there, options, user interface, and then you can kind of change those. So yeah, if you want yours to be sort of more similar to some other tool, that's fine. You've got to change it around. Yes? Okay, so let's think about it. Okay, so here it is, and you can save it, or what else? You can click on it. Yeah. Oh, well, it could be that. Let's see if it's even there. Because it's, let's see, and then we'll like, uh, figure it out. If sometimes you can it once, and it doesn't sort of seem to reload, it's actually just already there. Oh, this is to be downloaded, and it is placed one. It is placed one. Where you go, where it is, like, it will show us under this. All the options, it will be in there for this. Okay, but if you if you don't place it the first time, I'm not going to place it. Does that make sense? I'm going to get down to the bottom. It's hard once okay, you get so down to the point. Okay, so you can see it's in the list. Yeah, so but I split it to 8. There it is. Right? You're going to have to go down to the other end. I'm going to have to go down to the other end. I'm not going to do it anymore. What did you get? I got down to like 6. I got down to 7. I got down to 7. I got down to 7. You know, we started. Okay, great. So go ahead and set up one that's the right size shoe. Yeah, I'm just trying to make brick plates circular. I'm trying to save the change of conversation next to us. Yeah, it could be something complaining about. It's really. Oh, what's happening? Yeah, we'll say what happens now. So it can't make it? I don't want to edit both of them. Whoa! Okay, if something we should try doing it over in the the other one. See if I want to do there. Something about it's breaking when you try and do that. I think it's something to do with the circles. You might say, yeah. If it's if it's that the holes are too big and then they start intersecting, we'll complain about that. How about for now? Go with the one you like, and then we can like, uh, yeah, go test it back over on the other one. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so like yours, oh, okay, we're just cutting it halfway through. I think you'd have to make a different camera. Oh, so you actually this one. If says load, you would just load it. Good. Definitely yes. If I wanted to edit, say, just this brick, I'd have to make a new family and create it as an instance and insert it, correct? You can make a. Edit it and say duplicate type. And then say duplicate, okay? And then you can make a new type and make a new length and new width and new color. How do we deal with like the mortar? <laughs> That's actually definitely it's a hard one to deal with in that. Okay, so let's get some of these questions. Oh, let me do this for everyone and show you what's going on. Okay, so here's the deal. I got one basic brick over here, and that one basic brick is kind of looking okay. If you wanted to go through and create another brick of another size and style and stuff like that, all I need to do is actually go to my home, say component. There's my brick. If I want to create a new one, I'll edit its type. 
I'll duplicate this one. I'm going to say this is my uh, brick two, and I can even sort of specify, oh, it's going to be uh, one foot by whatever, or just a uh, light color, whatever it is, it's going to be your difference for this whole thing. You just need to give it some sort of distinction that will help you figure out what the difference is. Okay, for that, I can then start to specify something different about it. It's going to be a foot long and maybe a different color. As opposed to brick one, it's going to be some color. Let me say it's a brick two color, and it's going to be um, some tan color or something like that. So all I'm doing is saying, if you need to have a second brick, what you do is you just go ahead and duplicate the type. And now I'll have the brick one. Let me go ahead and I'll change the name on this one. I'm going to rename this one to be brick one dark. So now I have two bricks, dark and light. They're actually slightly different sizes too. Let me just change it from the color. That'll be make it a little fairer about what we're doing. Okay. So now I have two different types I can switch between. So how that works is, if I go through and place a light one next to it over here, it's fine. I can place another light one next to that, and that's fine. Oops. Component. But then if I want to change one from light to dark, I just switch to the other type. And you go popping around back and forth. So you can go through and, using as many different types as you have, go through and place them and start changing the type back and forth to get between different sizes and different colors and different materials. There's, they sort of snap based on the ed edges of each other, okay, but the faces kind of hug up against each other, but other than that, it's kind of hard to kind of get them precisely located. But let's talk about what you can do to kind of make this a little bit easier. And it sort of gets to the issue of what do you do about the mortar? Because the deal is, you got blocks of bricks that are seven and five eighths inch. You don't want to space them that way. You really want to space them out every eight inches. Okay. So modeling the mortar, it turns out, is really, really hard. Although you could go ahead and put mortar on the sides of that brick and decide whether you want to make it visible or not. You know, we can make a very smart brick that has mortar attached to it or something like that. As a starting point, though, most people would just model the bricks and just sort of give a gap between them, so at least they're dimensionally accurate. Okay. And then we can think about how to like go ahead and represent that in order. But what you might want to do is something like this, because I could go through and take these bricks and keep on placing them. And when I hug up against a corner and I snap up against a corner there, will it snap there? There it is. It's a little bit off there. Let me bring another one in. Okay, that's actually doing that. But that's going to be a little bit imprecise over time, so a better thing to do is something like this. Let me go to the course one diagram, which kind of shows those. Here's the deal. I got course one, I'm going to lay a bunch of bricks all on a wall here to make that happen. And what I would really like to have happen is not actually have them seven and five eighths, I'd like to actually be able to use a little arraying, a little grouping, and things like that to have them laid out pretty really automatically for me. So different things you can kind of do. One thing you can do is, if you know that this is the outside edge, and you want to place them, and you always want to make sure the edges line up with that wall, one thing you can do is put in a reference plane there, and then hug the bricks up against that wall. That way you have something to align to. Even though it's not a real surface, it's just sort of going to indicate where the outside surface is. And what I, would, what I mean by that is I could do something like, oh, let me find it under the Home tab. It's way over here on the right-hand side. I can set a reference plane. And I can go ahead and just draw a line over here. And then use that really as an alignment surface. Because what I can do now is basically, you know, things will try to hug to it. So if I pull these out... Can you, um, oh, yeah. you make curve, like, reference lines? Or no? Sure. Can you make, like, curve, reference lines? No. Planes are always planes. Oh, okay. Although, if you want to, that would be, you can make a, re oh, a reference plane. A reference line could be curved. Oh, okay. Correct. Okay. So, if you have a reference plane or reference line to work with, one thing you can do is use the align tool. We kind of played with that a while ago. And then you can take that and bring those to it and lock it to it. 
And the nice thing about that is that you really will get a completely uh, straight surface. You know, it'll be flat. It'll be what you want it to be. Okay. But let me show you another way, which I think may actually come in a little bit more handy for you. And that is, if you just take a single brick there, if I'm creating a straight wall, there really is a relationship between all those things. I want a bunch of copies in this brick, and although my brick is only 7 and 5 inches, I always want them spaced 8 inches apart, leaving a little gap for the mortar. Thank you. So, in the scheme of drafting and modeling, that's the perfect case to use an array. They are group sort of duplicate copy. I could copy them one at a time. Let me just show you how that works. To start with, you could just say copy, and I could choose that point and say I want them to be eight inches away, and just sort of place it in there, zero foot eight. And then I can do this one and copy it, and I'll move it over eight inches. And that's one way to do it. And if you really need brick by brick precision control, do it that way. Okay, but if you really want to have a whole bunch, if you want 15 in a row that are all going to have that same basic shape to it, think about arraying them. And let me show you how that works. Arraying is like copy, only as opposed to just copying, you also say how many to make. The array tool, is, if this is copy, array is right over here. It looks like four squares. AR for array. You can go through and choose. You can go through and pull that out eight inches to place the first one. Okay, and then it'll give you the option of how many you want. So if I know that I want 12 of those, it'll put a whole bunch in there. It's pretty dope, yeah. If it turns out that you only need 11, whatever it is, do that. And you can decide when you array things whether or not you want them to stay grouped or not. Right now, by default, it groups them, but if you want to have individual control over on them, then you can say, un uh, just place them, but don't group them. So let's think about what that would be good for. Let me roll back to 3D. So I got my big old row of blocks here. That's actually looking pretty good in terms of what's going on. Let's say I actually want to have a little bit of a pattern here. Every third one I want to be light, or just you know, every fourth one I want to go knit. Whatever it is, I have some pattern in there. Like, yes? Why is it selecting the down here? Because it's grouped right now. So if you want to basically remove that from the group, what you got to do is just choose it and say ungroup it, and then you can change it. So here's the deal. The issue is if I want to change that third one to being like independent, or really, I'm going to ungroup the whole row of them because I already have a row. I'm just going to choose the whole row. I'm going to ungroup them because I'm going to be able to change these individually. Now I can get them. I can say that one over there. I'm going to make the light one. This one over here. I'm just going to take out and not even have it there at all. This one over here, I'm going to make a light one again. And just whatever pattern it is you want to try and establish for this thing. Okay, I, put, I put them in every 8 inches because if I had the 7 and 5 eighths inch and I wanted to allow a little space for the, uh, the mortar, that gave me that little bit of gap. So go ahead and try and get yourself set up with one row of what you like. And as soon as you have one row, we'll go ahead and copy it up and make another row and make another row. And hopefully you'll be looking pretty good. So just to check this out, let me go to course one. I'll shade that. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Let me go to course two. Actually, before we go too far, let me go ahead and fix something about the course two. Okay, my course one plan here is looking awfully good. Okay, that's looking fine. I can perfect that in color, and whoever's got a pretty good time understanding what's what's built. Okay. Course one, I remember, we were real careful. We set up the uh, new range and the cut and everything was really good. Course two, it turns out, although we created level two, we didn't do a really good job of setting up its new range yet. It's still kind of the default. But here's what we're going to do that will actually help us in terms of working with this. Okay. We set up something really nicely for course one in terms of the view range. range. We'd like to basically use that same sort of view range on level two, level three, level four, and stuff like that. So what we can do is actually do something called a view template. So I'm, I'm pretty certain this will work. Not, oh, let me see. Let me see if it works for, for first, and then I'll like uh, 
can oh tell you to make sure or i'll share it with you guys my view view templates create a template from the current view And all I want to do is get the visibility graphics. What I really want is the view range. OK, that should be good. Let me try applying it here and see if this actually works. OK, and then for course two, oops. Yeah, that actually did the right thing. Okay, that's good. So here's the basic deal. Since you went through, actually, I should just check to make sure that we actually need this. Yeah, see, by default, they're set to four feet above and things are sort of not where we want them to be. Okay. Course one was set all right. It had a good view range. It was from zero going down two and three quarters inches. That was pretty good. So if you want to go through and be able to use that for a lot of other ones, what you can do is do this. You go to the view tab and there's this thing called a view template. If you choose view template, you can say create a template from the current view. And oh, again, I'm going to call this my brick course plan. I'll say OK to that. You get to choose which settings you want to grab because you can grab any of these settings. I can grab the scale, I can grab the view range, I can grab the shading, I can grab them all. The one that we're really concerned about is the core of the view range. That's the one I really want to be able to grab. So I can copy over. So what I can do is turn off a bunch of those. The only one that's really critical to me is view range. That's the one that I want to really make sure is the same. So all you, you can keep them all in there. View range is the only critical one to get in there. The issue is really if you want them all to have the same scale, have the same level of coarseness, have the same color, things like that. But view range is the one I'm sort of critical on. Maybe what I'll do is I'll keep the um, I'll keep the same model display. That's going to be at the shaded, and I'll keep the same scale. It's, it's kind of nice to have uniformity between your different plans. But you have to decide how much uniformity you do want to copy and don't want to copy. Yeah. Just case, everything I'm creating something called the brick course plan view template. And then once I've created that, say OK to that. It basically is a group of settings that you could apply. It's almost like a style sheet in Microsoft Word. You can apply it to a bunch of other plans, and it'll take those same style settings and make them all have the same style. So how that works is then, if I say course 2 through course 19, and I right-click, you can apply a view template, and I can apply that course plan to it. Okay, and the nice thing then is, if we go to 19, and I look at what the view range is there, 18, again, the settings will be appropriate will sort of match what they should be. So that same very limited two and three quarter inch range, I copy over. So what is the net effect of that? Let's take a look. The net effect is that on course one, I can see my bricks. On course two, I can still see the bricks because of the level below. And I still said, show me a little bit further. But on course three, I can't see them. Okay, so I'm only able to look down one level. Well, this really is. It's kind of all just kind of graphics, whatever's going to make it easiest to go through and present or create your drawings that you need. Okay, so we got these different views. So what's going on? Oh, so where are you now? Well, let's go to 3D and let's see if it's even there. Okay, there we go. Go back to course one. Yeah, all right, not good one. Okay, let's take a look at your view range and we'll see if we need to adjust it there. Up here. Okay, oh, so there it is. Go level. Okay, so say that we want to go, we're going to change the settings. It's going to be. Uh, okay, charge that name and then. Pull up, you know, say this associate level. Make that a zero. That's at zero. Right click on brick one. Okay, let's say this down here is like, um, it's like uh, zero associate level minus five. Fine. Okay. okay. No. And then I think we're good there. Oh. Okay. That plane is below the top. No. Let me see what else. Let's do a running. I think yeah, something got confused. 
Uh, minus zero point. Okay. So, U depth plane is set to oh, the one the 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 Oh, you're in the ceiling plane. That's why. Yeah, I'm sorry. Whatever you need is. So, that's why it's complaining because we're looking upside down. Okay, there you go. And so, here's your view template there. In terms of your view template, Okay, that's looking good there. And you made a new template of that? Yeah, I, I, I did. Um, okay, then we'll try this. And we'll try applying that new template. Let's like, yeah, okay, go ahead and make that again. Okay, no worries. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some stuff. Yeah, it's got a couple more questions on this in a second. Yes. Oh, okay, it's a type thing, so let's go ahead and edit your types. And then we have a root material. Let's change this one to like root two, or let's give it a different material. Watch it, go into the dialogue because we'll need to go through and like that create the other material that she has in the So how about let's uh can't yeah, we have to, uh, yeah, create a new material. Actually, go to like identity of graphics. Hang on. Create a new one. And we'll give it a name like a uh, brick two or whatever it is. A brick light. There it is. And then for the graphic appearance, let's choose a different color for it. Okay. Say okay. Now, oops. Do I say close to that? Let's see if I can take a look. I don't know. Make sure it's Yeah. I think we'll start the video. So now, hmm. It looks like they're both the same color. Um, let's go back to the edit text again. So say edit text. Okay, that's brick one. Okay, let's take a look at what color it is. Yeah. Ah, let's go ahead and choose a different color. Okay, that's brick one. Let's go instead and go to the brick two. And change it. Oh, let's choose the one part. And then we'll get it. Yes. Because it's basically it's maps to the name. Okay. Let's we'll say apply to that. Save it for the rest. Let's go back and find it. It's whatever we called it in that dialogue. Maybe not. Say, say, say it to it. Uh, say it right there. Exactly. Um, okay, give it a different shape of here. Like orange. No. Nothing else right there. Right there. Mm -hmm. Let's just do some little order thing over here that's just set. There's for two, that's one, and there's the next one. Yep. Okay. Check, check, check it. 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 Check Well, that's because that's still over two versus four. There are two of them. Right. Yeah, we were changing you know, like several things at once. Okay. Well, okay. lines are really because there's like a pattern right. of lines. Okay. Let's get started over. You doing good over here? Um, I think this. Okay. So you you have a view range as part of it. That's okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. So let me go over here and let me start try to apply it to here. Apply the new template to uh, the brick course plan. Yeah, that one is there. I just the So now in course two, if I take a look at the view range, it's okay. So he's got to apply it to that. So we Yeah. Yep. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some oh, stacking for all you people who want to make a pattern. Okay, so here's the deal. You can go ahead and array and group to get a single line. That'll get you going with a pattern. You typically also want to go through and come up and kind of create a pattern that's kind of working to up the wall. I see some beautiful stacking going on over there. Okay, so let's show you how you can do that. What I will do is I'm going to go to the elevation view, like the south elevation, because then I can see all my little bricks. And oh, somehow my uh, level lines are so far off from where they need to be because when I changed the scale, they all went way over there. Let me kind of show you how to fix that just in case you want to. And it's like this. See all these level lines that are sort of way over there too long? Well, actually, I can do a couple different things. 
I'm gonna do the sneaky thing, which is I'm gonna crop the view, because the crop view will actually go through and bring the level lines in. So there's the view cropping, it's one of the tools that's available down here. I can turn on the crop, then show the range, and this is how big the view is right now. But if I actually pull those in, it'll actually pull those lines in there too. So, okay, what you do is go to the elevation view. Um, like southeast, north, or west. I went. I used to go to south because I'm putting them on the sort of south side of the building. Okay, and yep. And then actually got it. And then down over here, you can turn on the crop. Is that guy? And then this guy over here will turn on the blue box. And now you can go ahead and pull the boundaries in. Which one's crop? What's that? Which one's crop? Oh, it's this guy that's right over here. It's it looks kind of like crop, like the crop symbol in Photoshop. Kind of like these, uh, and then right next to it, after you crop it, you need to show the crop region. I always show it. I think it's kind of annoying that you can crop it, you don't see the region. That makes it sort of very mysterious about what's going on. Can you just show the one that's already there and show it? Yeah. Oh, that, that would be another way to do it. But at some point, you just gotta like move it all, move it all in. Okay. Okay, so once you have a view and you have some bricks in the view and you want to start stacking up, in the same way that we could go through and do the arraying, do the arraying to go ahead and stack them all out to the left, okay, what I can do is take this row and array it up and over, or I can array it straight up, depending on which one. If you want a stack pattern, I'll go ahead and array these, this array up, array up, I can actually make 18 of them make a whole wall that has just a stack bond going all the way up. If I want more of a running bond or something like that, what I'll do is I'll go up and over to kind of create the run, okay? And then I can even sort of do one and then copy those two to make a second and a third and array it up, or I can do them all and go back and fix. There's like, you know, any number of ways to do it because you're just pretty much stacking blocks at that point. But let's kind of show you those variations. So here's the deal. I got these guys, I got all my blocks. I want to go through and select all my blocks. Now for selecting all your blocks, you can drag to get a bunch of them, or shift, or is it control click actually to get a bunch of them. Either way, whatever it takes to get the whole row. And I tend to drag, and when I drag, if you sort of drag around like that, but I don't completely enclose anything else, I'll just get the blocks. See so if you can select your blocks. And then what I'll do is, if again, if I want to copy, that's fine, but I'll tend to array because I want to do a couple of them. And arraying would let me say, okay, I'll take this and I want to go up like zero foot two and three quarters. And then how many of those to put in there? I'll put all 15 in there and I'll make a nice stack bond wall. Okay. Or if you don't want so much of a stack bond, you okay. Now, although these things are all stacked, you can still go ahead and change them. I should tell you about that. Currently in the group, so we'll ungroup them to go ahead and let you be able to change everything individually. But if I want to keep most of them the same and I only want to go ahead and change some things, well, let me show you that. That's kind of a good issue about grouping. Let's say, for example, I want most of my pattern to be like this. Red, 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 dark, red, 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 space. But this one row up in here, halfway through, I want to do some change to. I want to have a different pattern there. How you can do that is as follows. Okay. Currently, they're all grouped. And the nice thing about when things are grouped is you can't change them individually. But if you edit the group, and you make a change to an element in the group. For example, I will change that to be a light color brick in the group. When I finish the group, it'll percolate that change to all the other instances. Because what happens is when things are grouped, they're all clones of each other. So you have a choice. If you want to keep something percolated through the entire thing, edit the group, make a change to one part of the group, and when you close the group, everything else that is cloned off that group will have the same thing to it. So that's not bad. Sometimes that's a really useful thing. Again, let me show you how I did that. So let me go ahead and cancel this or finish this. I started out just like this. Well, actually, I didn't do that. Let me finish. Let me go roll back to more. There we go. It was more like this. I started out with them all looking even. 
If I wanted to go and I could do it to any of the members of the group, I could do it to this one. And if I edit that group, since they're all clones of each other, if I change that one to be a light color brick, and I change, say, that one to be a light color brick, what will happen is when I finish, all the other cloned instances will pick up that same change. Okay, so that's kind of okay in terms of like uh, cloning. However, if you don't want them changing to be cloned for everything, you may have two or three different patterns you know, that you want to sort of bring across. How you can deal with that is as follows. Okay, let's say this was like the group one. Group one is like my bricks which are all alternating. Maybe my like group two wants to be you know, bricks where they're all red, or maybe one has a hole in it, something like that. Okay, this is where it gets really kind of cool. What you can do is, it turns out groups are down here, and just like the others, kind of like as a family also. Let's see if I can grab that group and make sense of it right there. It's model group array one. It turns out I can edit this type. Let me rename it. See if I can call it, oh, alternating. Oh, I want to be able to duplicate that. Let's see if it's going to let me. That's it. Why is it not showing up? I'm going to think about it because I want that to be able to show up and let me change it and duplicate it. Hmm, <laughs> is it because they're still associated? I'm going to think about that in just a second. Well, let me do it the other way. I'll create the other group the other way. Let's go ahead and choose a row over here. For example, maybe the third row. And what I'm going to do is actually, I'm going to ungroup it. Why am I going to ungroup it? Because I want to make changes to it, and I don't want to make those changes to the other group. So I'll ungroup it. Okay, now this row is independent, so I can go ahead and change the pattern on this group. This group, I'm going to change all those to be the dark color. Okay, and maybe even take that one out and just remove it. Okay, so this is now my second pattern. And what I can do now is choose those. Oops, not that. Again, not that. Grab all these. And when I have this row's pattern defined, what could I do? I'm going to go through and make that into a group. And why is the grouping not showing up for me? Modify to pick host edit family. Oh, there it is. It's create group, it's right there. I'll create a group out of that. I'm going to call this, this is my um, solid with hole. Okay, so now I actually have two different groups. I have the alternating and I have the solid with hole. The nice thing is, once you have those two different groups, I can choose this one and I can just actually sort of uh, change between them. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm really wondering why this thing's fighting me. Molid group, solid with hole. Why is it not let, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure this out and figure out why it's not letting me do it. There's solid with hole. There is a group. I think it's because they're all associated. Actually, that will sort of work. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, here's the deal. I think what's happening is because they're still associated as part of the array, it's not letting me sort of manipulate them individually. No worries. Let me show you what I need to do. I'm going to go through and although I use the array to change these, let me ungroup these. And then I'm going to regroup them outside of the array. And I'm going to apologize if this just sounds like really esoteric, like modeling gobbledygook. But I hope it'll make sense pretty soon. That's a scientific term. Okay, grouping is up over here. It's under create. You can say create a group. I'm going to call this one, oh, um, alternating uh, colors. 
Two. Okay. So what do I like to have these things? Because I want to do is actually have a bunch in here so I can actually pull up and say, I want to get an alternating color two row. I want to get an alternating color two row. I want a solid with whole row. Because by doing that, you're basically giving yourself the ability to kind of like stack. So what you're going to do is, you know, start small, start with an individual brick and create like little runs that have the patterns you want. Then, as you start to have those patterns, create groups that have a bunch of them all stuck together. And then you can go ahead and like, uh, you know, start stacking them and changing and stuff like that. Now, what I did here, this is also sort of a stack bond wall. That may not look like your wall, not to worry. If I take that group and I move it over four inches, okay, I'm going to start having more of a running bond wall. And how would we say now we fill in that little gap at the end of the wall without actually turning a brick going into? You, you have to turn a brick. Safe is only looking. So yeah. Uh, so you either have to turn a brick, or if you have a lot of angles, you might have to even kind of make some bricks that are cut in funny ways to do it. Which is actually sort of what your your mason has to do too. So the the good and the bad of this whole methodology is you get to experience all the joy and all the pain. Sort of model. Yeah. It's like, just kind of like when you have to do it in all the little wooden models in terms of all that type of stuff. You're really building it up a lot at a time in terms of what's going on here. Okay, now, hopefully this will get you going. We got about like, oh, 15 more minutes, so I want to show you one more thing about just quantifying, or I'll show you about like a section view and then quantifying it. But then, in terms of pattern making and stuff like that, it really, it's variations on placing, grouping, and kind of moving to try and do it. Is that kind of okay? You sort of get a sense of where that's all going? Okay, it's kind of like being in the model shop and just making them out of wood, only now you're doing it virtually. Okay, and when it's time to go through and create your uh, accounts for these things, let's talk about that. The nice thing is, all these little guys are objects, and Revit is really good at counting objects. So, when it comes time to do a count, try this. This will actually work really easily, compared to some of this exotic stuff. Under Views, under the View tab, try going to this part that says Schedule. Because what we're going to do is we're going to create a schedule, which is a listing of all the different elements. So I'll say Schedules. And I'm going to do a schedule of quantities. And here's what I'm going to do within there. I'm going to create a schedule, and what did it, were they? They were a bunch of generic objects, weren't they? Oh, did I mess myself up by making them generic objects? I don't know. Oh, show categories. Let me see if this is going to work. Oh, tell me that's not so. Hang on. Because you, you want to basically schedule these things and let me sort of, uh, they're all generic models, right? No. That was Brick Family 2, color only, that's fine. So is that like the family we should use them? Well, so that, that's, as, as I go through my moment of panic here, I'm going to like figure it out. Because no, exactly, I, I want you to do that, but hang on. Because generic, I could swear you can schedule those. If they aren't, we're just going to make them a different type. Okay. Since that seems to be fighting us, let's go ahead and we're going to just make a small change here. Although we went through and we call these a generic family up first, Okay, not to worry. If the family type you have isn't really the family that you, uh, whatever, you want to change the type, you can. There's the family types over here, but if I need to make it to a different category, I can actually change the family category. So as opposed to a generic model, what do we want to call this? I could call this a mass, I could call it a piece of furniture. We call it a mass. Nope, won't, won't do that. How about... Here's the ball. Ah, but not mass. Oh, it could be a piece of specialty equipment. It could be a piece of casework or a piece of furniture. Columns, Columns are in there. Let me try this. I'm going to actually make it. Oh, I'm going to make it a piece of furniture. I know that may doesn't sound like a very good choice right now, but let me just try it and see if this will work. 
So I'm just looking for a way to bail us out after we put all this hard work in. Okay, so we'll say, okay. And then what I'm going to do is save this. Since I've already kind of given it a new type, I'm going to reload it into the project. Okay, what I think is going to happen now is back over here, they're going to show up under furniture pieces instead. Okay. So I think that's going to work out okay. How did, how did you do that? What I did was I went back over to the family itself, uh, that kind of family, and over here, as opposed to changing the family types, I actually changed the family category. It's right above it, and you can assign it to a different category. Yeah. And again, the only reason I have to do this really is because uh, I want to be able to quantify these things, and for whatever reason, it doesn't like to seem like it wants to quantify those. So here I am. I'm going to create a schedule again. I'm going to create a schedule of furniture. Although I could call this my brick count schedule instead because it's really not furniture. I'll say what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and put in there the family and type because that, that's going to tell me, uh, you know, the size. So what I do is I go through and I create a schedule. It's going to be a furniture only because that's the funny thing I'm using as a placeholder for what we're doing. I'm going to call this the brick count schedule. And then once I got that, what I'm going to do is basically put in the type is really the most interesting thing because the type is whether it's a light or a dark or whatever the size is. And I go through and put the count in. So let me try that and say OK. OK. So what I have here is a big old schedule which is showing all those different bricks individually sort of uh, counted out there. OK. OK, but not so good. We'll fix that. What we need to do is do a little sorting. So I'm going to go over here and sort. I'm going to sort them so it's sorted by type. Okay, and then I can also turn off this thing where it's, well, let's just sort it by type first. That'll do this. Okay, so now all the brick ones are above the uh, light. Okay, so far so good. What I want to do is go through and say, not itemize every instance, but what I do want to do is put a subtotal on these things. I'd like to basically go ahead and subtotal how many are in each section and not show every individual one. And if I do that, I can see that there are 123 of the dark ones and 64 of the white ones. Wait, what's going on? Go back. Yep. So where it is is under sorting and grouping, I sort by type. That'll get the lights and the darks or whatever is like that separated from each other. Oh man. I'm gonna turn off the itemize every. If I leave that on, they all still show up, but the subtotal shows there. But I will go ahead and put this footer on there because I want to have a footer. Maybe it'll just have the count only. I'll put the title and the count. I like that. Okay. And then we can actually see that there are 123 of these, 64 of those. Actually, I don't even need to put right next to the fingers in the table there. So that looks like that may be super superfluous. Okay. So you can start building the table that way. So it's one of those things, if you stack them, if you count them, okay, but as you go through and approach it this way, the big issue is going to be, you know, start with that super block, you know, make as many different variations as you need, and then try to basically use arraying and grouping to make your pattern making as easy as possible, and then go ahead and swap out the individual ones for the special cases you need. What should we build it in? Instead of generic model, what should we build it as? It's really, it could be, it's, it's really anything except generic model. So, yeah, yeah, for, I mean, I switched it over to furniture and that was kind of okay. It's, I really wish it was a good category. If mass is kind of a special category. Is there a, compo a component category? Could you set it as a component? It's not kind of a generic, like a, yeah, everything always has a type. So, you know, I use whichever one sort of resonates the most with you. I don't have really a good recommendation for it. Yes. Okay, so you got that nice little list. What we're going to do is go to sorting and grouping. And we're going to sort by the type. That way they at least group together. And then go ahead and turn off itemize every instance. 
Six hundred and forty million. Oh my lord. Yeah, there you go. 150 of the same in there. Oh my god, I'm gonna have a heart attack. No, it's yeah. just gonna keep growing. I know. I'll move on. Oh my, okay. I'm sorry, I'm totally off track. Right that's actually uh, <laughs> it was like five hundred yesterday, was it? Yeah, it was 476 yesterday, now it's 640. Yeah, I know what everyone did this afternoon. Okay, very good. So let's go ahead and stop for there. Uh, let me answer any last questions for you in terms of what's going on. Hopefully it'll be enough to kind of get you going, you know, in terms of stacking this thing out. Yeah, what, you have like two weeks to do this, or ha yeah, when does it all come together? Uh, soon. Okay. Okay. Let's go ahead and do this, because probably the best thing to do is have you actually get started with your stacking and just trying to build stuff like that. And I've been offering for like all the classes, and for your class too. If we come to the point where like, you know, after a couple days of doing this, you're all running into problems and you need some help and stuff like that, hey. I do this all the time. We set up like an online session where you know, we get together in one of these rooms. I'm showing up via the computer screen, okay, but answering questions and helping to demonstrate and just kind of get things going that way. So as you get going, because we're just sort of starting into it, but we're going to run into all sorts of these different issues. Yeah, you know, choose amongst yourself. Whoever uh, can second your studio like uh, wants to do it. But yeah, if you, if you feel the need to kind of have a session for something. Uh, just get in touch with me, and we'll go ahead and set something up. It's a convenient time, whether it's next Friday or whenever it is. Yeah, it sort of makes sense. Um, what 